Welcome to Pub Natter, where we record each episode in a different pub in Rutland, the smallest county in England. In each episode, your hosts, Tim and Justin, give a voice to the landlords and landladies and a special guest with a specific area of interest or expertise. We hope you enjoy our chats and it encourages you to go and explore our little county and all it has to offer. Like the motto says, there is much in little. This episode was recently recorded at the award-winning Olive Branch in Clipsham, Rutland, on the same day that we chatted with the co-owner, Ben Jones. In our chat with Ben, we discussed how he transformed a dilapidated building into only the second pub in UK to be awarded a Michelin star. In this episode, we host Alicia Cairns, Member of Parliament for Melton and Rutland. I know you will enjoy our discussion, so please leave a comment via your favourite platform. You can now listen and comment via Spotify, YouTube, Amazon Music, Podbean or Apple Podcasts. When rain stops play, it's time for some pub natter. Um, we're in the Olive Branch in Clipsham in Rutland and we're with Alicia Kearns, Member of Parliament for Melton and Rutland. Um, we're very lucky to have you and um, thank you very much for giving us your time. No, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Um, we plan to, to uh, make this apolitical. Um, Let's see how long that lasts. Yeah. <laughs> it's a challenge. We're determined to make it apolitical <laughs> because we're from different sides of the divide. Oh. So. Well, yeah. we, could get, well, we could flip the coin and I could interview the two of you about your politics <laughs> and we could see where we ended up. You've only got an hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So see if you can guess which is which. Yeah, I, okay. I think I might have sussed that already. Really? <laughs> okay. Just because I've got a beard doesn't mean I'm a liberal. <laughs> oh, maybe I haven't then. Um, so, yeah, essentially more on being a local MP. Yeah. Okay. So you can kick off with the first question, Justin. Okay. So before you got into politics, you did a lot of work in international communication and mm. um, foreign affairs. Obviously, you're going to be quite limited in what you can say, but have you got any interesting stories, anecdotes that you can give us about, that give an insight into the sort of thing you have to cope with? It's difficult, yeah, because there's all sorts of weird experiences that you go through, but difficult, again, sometimes to recount. Um, I think one of the ones I, I have spoken about publicly is I was working at the Syria Peace Talks uh, in Geneva, possibly the most boring place on earth. But um, I worked you, there. <laughs> did you enjoy working there? In, it's just outside in Neil. But um, no, not really. The biggest problem was the lunches. So we were obviously doing peace talks until, you know, three o'clock in the morning, getting up incredibly early. If you didn't get to a restaurant by one o'clock, they were like, mais non, it is too late. We will not serve you. And you went... It's, it's only one o'clock. That's typically Swiss. And even the McDonald's closed at 10 p.m. Yeah. And it was like 12 pounds for like a happy meal. I mean, it was, yeah. Anyway, I wasn't a child, but you know, sometimes you, you the, the mood gets you. Anyway, um, I was working at the Syria Peace Talks and I remember that Lavrov, who's obviously the long-standing Russian foreign secretary, decided that I was some kind of stooge spy put in place to, to cause him hell. And every day he would do a press conference from this room and every day I would go... So would some of the other ambassadors from other countries, and so would all the media. And he made a formal complaint to the UN that I was distracting him and that I'd been put in to undermine him and, you know, cause trouble. And so the next day the UN came along and said, we're really sorry, but the Russians have said that you can't be in the room. And I went, we're in a hall in the middle of the UN. There's no control of what, who can come in and who can't. And they went, well, he's asked for it. And I said, well, no, I'm not doing it. Um, and they said, OK, fine. The next day they came back and they're like, no, no, you, you absolutely cannot be here. You must leave. And what was really nice was the BBC, the Al Jazeera correspondent, and a few others turned around and said, you, you can't make her leave. There's, you've got no right or ability to do so. Um, and essentially they started kicking up quite a big fuss. Um, and so the, the kind of official went away again. Third day, came again, tried again. And they said, well, media can be here because it's a press conference, but you can't be here because you're here as a diplomatic member of a diplomatic delegation. And at this point, the Swedish ambassador came over and said, well, if you're throwing her out, you're throwing me out. And obviously, senior <laughs> Swedish ambassador, little old me, they couldn't throw him out. So that was it. The next day we came along and they had a name list ticking people in and out. So I was like, right, fine. So the next day I got there early enough that I got there before they got there with their tick list. <laughs> it got to the point that by the end of it, they'd put 
giant metal locks on the doors to stop people coming in unless early to this event because they were so determined to keep me out. Because Blimey. Lavrov had yeah, just decided that I was essentially some sort of spy who was there to distract him and undermine him and cause him problems. Were you? Uh, no, but I think it just shows how ridiculous you um, know how, some people get. How long ago was this? 2015 or 16 it would have been. Wow. So you've made an em yeah. enemy of Sergei Lavrov and... Ten years on, you're still here to tell the tale. That's yeah, I, yeah. Well, that is impressive. Although I imagine he doesn't remember who I am, but I was put on a Russian no-fly list quite quickly wow. thereafter. But yeah, I notice you're keeping your hand over your hot chocolate. Yes, I wasn't even meaning to, but yeah, you do. You just have those moments ever so often. Going, should I be? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that is an interesting story. Just bizarre. Shows what the Russians are like. But anyway, so did you did you thoroughly enjoy those days? I did. Yeah. The sense of cause of what you were trying to achieve and what you were working on, it was so important. Everyone working together, you know, you worked incredible hours. Everything you were doing was to try and move you closer to stability and peace. And, you know, you met the most amazing heroic people, but you also, on the other side of things, you know, a lot of that time working on that job, I'd have to look at victims of people who'd been tortured and mm. meet women who'd been through appalling things in the sad prisons and the men, children... Um, so you saw the darkest side of humanity, but it also made you even more determined that you were going to get things done. Um, so I loved it. I absolutely loved it. The, the average person in UK probably doesn't really fully know the roles that people do mm. within that realm. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Completely. And I think that's why the reaction to October 7th and the appalling crimes against humanity that were committed in Israel... I think particularly when it comes to sexual violence, you really see people really shocked that people can be that inhumane and that evil. But you have seen those elements of that level of violence in Syria, in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Sudan, in, in Rwanda, all these different places, in Bosnia. But it either wasn't on our TV screens or it was sanitised, but you didn't have any of that with what happened on October 7th because the terrorists themselves were filming it. Whereas in my career, we were the ones going out trying to get evidence. So we were the ones collecting the films. So therefore you did see the films that nobody ever normally sees. And I think that's also why, you know, any of us who've worked on Syria in particular, you will never forget Syria. Syria will always be in your heart, the same as the way sure, I feel yeah. about Bosnia because of how heinous it is. So do you think to some extent then that the world has always been this bad, but we're only now seeing seeing the evidence real time i think the capacity for evil has always been this severe but we as humans have gone and industrialized it and mechanized it and made it easier and i think we've removed by creating weapons i mean you'll know more from your time in the air force but by creating weapons you do reduce some of that innate humanity that is required within the choosing to commit or perpetrate violence mm. because it's easier. You're not having to physically throttle someone. You can shoot them or you can whatever you want to do. Um, so I think it's always been there. The capacity has always been there. We've just made it easier, more industrialised. Absolutely. But also, I mean, people say, oh, well, Ukraine's the first war that's been fought with modern technologies. Syria was, just nobody wanted to pay attention. Yeah. And I think people like Lindsay Hilson on Channel 4... They're, they're bringing that more to the public now, so there's, there's more awareness. Yeah, of and there's less on. of a. I do think the media decided they don't need to sanitise it as much as they used to, and that's because of social media, obviously, and the fact that people can access it. Yeah, very quickly. So, I mean, it's scary on Twitter. I mean, you get stuff almost immediately, don't you? It's I mean, yeah. I mean, you might remember that morning, you know, the morning of the Hamas attack. The first thing I remember was being in bed with my two children, because they do sleep in my bed, and just watching all this footage while they were asleep next to me before it was, you know, scrubbed from the internet. Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally don't do Twitter. I Smart find man. Twitter <laughs> absolutely infuriating. Um, <laughs> so I ignore it. You are absolutely right to do so. And it's going to get more and more dangerous because of the ability of AI to create new videos and photographs. Yeah. There was, I was listening to an interesting um, discussion yesterday and they were saying how Twitter's going to be the worst because they've cut all their people that used to do the scrubbing of the internet. They've cut all their people who used to do authentication. At least on Facebook and Meta, they still have quite a lot of them. But it's, it's a real problem. And, and AI is so incredible now in terms of what it can do. It's going to be very difficult. I'm sure we're going to see videos of me at the next election saying... 
some fake video that says, oh, I hate Ratlander, blah, 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 blah. Something <laughs> that's completely constructed. But yeah. if you saw it on your Facebook, you'd go, oh my God, that's what she really thinks. And by the time I could get a statement out saying that's not true, A, psychologically, you're going to believe the video that you saw, even though it was a fake and you're being told it's a fake. And B, by the time it's got around the whole of Rutland, I won't have had, no one will, I won't have had time to respond. So, mm. Well, both of our listeners will know it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to two of you. Yeah. yeah. So was part of that, that amazing career that you've already had... Did that, was that part of your motivation to go into politics? It was. Um, so I was in the civil service. I mean, I, I actually wasn't, I wasn't always a conservative, so there was a whole political journey I had to go through, but... That's interesting. So yeah. let me guess, go you, you were a Lib Dem. No. Hardcore Labour household. Yeah, my parents were most certainly socialists. I don't think, I was never a socialist, um, but I was brought up in a very hardcore left-wing household. Uh, they met in East Berlin. Wow. So really are talking quite hardcore. My, I'm, I'm half German. Oh. And I, I was brought up in a socialist household. Where in Germany? My mum was originally from Leipzig. And uh, oh, she wow. escaped as a refugee yeah. from East Germany to Switzerland. Oh, wow. Before she came to UK. So we lived in Germany for a little bit as a child. So I often say I love Germany more than most Germans do. And my parents obviously yeah. love Germany for but obvious reasons. Berlin isn't really representative of Germany, as you know. It's no. a great city. It, uh, one of the best cities in the world. In oh, see, opinion. I don't really like Berlin. Do it's you? not, no. So I'm like a more of a Bavaria girl, oh, right. least, and, you know, places like that. I'm not, uh, I, yeah. I've I'm been not cool to enough Berlin. And Berlin. And of the two, I prefer Berlin. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Very see, arty. But Berlin's there, yeah, exactly. Berlin's arty and cool and alternative. I'm a conservative P MP. I'm therefore automatically not alternative, <laughs> cool or arty. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I'm just not cool enough for Berlin. It's, it's beautiful, though. So you um, somehow managed to move out of a socialist household and mm. become a conservative MP? Yes, through a very long journey, which I hadn't planned to go on, but I, I was in the civil service, and I started working with conservative ministers who I thought I would dislike, and they were really good people. And I went, well, how, how can this be? Tories aren't allowed to be good people and nice people. <laughs> um, and the Tory was only ever a term of offence in my household growing up, so I'd, you know, I'd never... Um, and for example, Helen Grant, one of the first ministers I worked for, she was, she wasn't, she had a different upbringing to me, but re similar in terms of, you know, she's a normal girl who'd gone to her local comp. She'd been raised by her mum and her great grandmother. She pulled herself up by her bootstraps, you know, gone into sport, got herself into university, become a domestic abuse lawyer for 24 years. And now she was a victims minister. And I was like, that's the kind of person that should be a victims minister. And slowly I started walking with all these ministers and I realised they were good people who wanted to do good things. And then... Prisoner voting came along and I felt really strongly about it that prisoners shouldn't get the vote while they're in prison because my view was that you have harmed our community so significantly that you have had to be removed from it. Once you have been through your rehabilitation, of course you get a full right to vote. But I felt very strongly about it and realising that none of my friends did who had the same politics as me as I thought was the kickoff of that journey. And then slowly but surely... You know, more and more things came along where I realised I was not in line with my family or a lot of my friends. And then, yeah, I kind of slowly took a lot of friends and parents out for dinner and told them that I'd realised that I had a <laughs> political epiphany. It was almost like coming out. Um, <laughs> and then I ended up where I was. And when I was thinking about politics, I'd always been very political with a small p in terms of my parents brought me up very passionate about international politics, caring about politics, thinking it matters. It was the time where you saw Jeremy Corbyn leading the Labour Party, talking about leaving NATO, the way he had relationships with certain organisations in uh, the Middle East, the way he talked about Ukraine, Russia. I found that very difficult and I saw, I loved being in the Foreign Office and I was offered the chance to transfer permanently and become a diplomat and that was everything I'd ever wanted. But I saw the discussions happening in Parliament on foreign policy and national security and they just seemed so absent of people who understood it. And I, you know, I hadn't had a 20-year career, but I, I had a good understanding of it. And we had the Syria vote, which I felt was a, a major error. And so that kind of led me into going, I think I need to go into politics. But also because within the civil service, I was quite a challenge function. So I was the person always saying, well, that's not going to actually achieve what we want. And people say to me, Alicia, it's enough. Just go home. And, you know, I thought if I'm this good at challenging the system within the system and changing the way we function, imagine what I could do if I was an MP with the power to hold civil service and the government to account. 
and then I lost my mind and went on that journey. So <laughs> it was, um, yeah. It, um, I, I was born into a Labour household, council estate, um, and I was the events organiser for Hillingdon Peace Council. I was in the People's March for Jobs. Um, uh, I was a member of the Hillingdon Communist Society. And then um, I, I left school and grew up and uh, Margaret Thatcher was in charge at the time. And I, I kind of had no choice but to sort myself out because the state wasn't going to do it for me anymore. So my my route of, I live in a council house, I'll leave home, I'll go get a council house and then a bigger council house when I have more children. That was gone. Um, and I flipped then mm. and be became a massive Margaret Thatcher fan. Yeah. Um, strangely enough, the first time in my life I didn't vote Conservative, I'm sorry to say, was last time. And that was nothing to do with you. <laughs> I'm going to cry. It was nothing go to do on, with you fine, and everything to do with the fact I could not bring myself to vote for Boris Johnson as Prime yeah. Minister. I don't particularly dislike him. I don't think that he's as bad as he's painted, but mm. I, I just couldn't. Um, yeah, and to be honest, in this area, I could vote green, mm. let, have my kids love me again, <laughs> and it was a free hit. Because you can't I, ever again. <laughs> a, no, no, I won't yeah. now. I haven't met yeah. you. But, but, no, um, but it's a really interesting challenge, about uh, particularly that question about who are you voting for? Are that, you voting for your local? Please, go on. Yeah. I mean, do you think people in the UK think we have an American system? I think increasingly they do, and I think they think I'm voting for who do I want to see as Prime Minister, is it Keir Starmer, is it Rishi Sunak? And they think, do I want to vote Conservative, or do I want to vote Labour, or Lib Dem, or Green, or Independent? But the reality is you are voting for that local representative, and as we've seen over the last few years, there's yeah, a lot of people who change parties, there's a lot of people who've not always voted with their party. Um, so I do think, I mean, from my perspective, obviously, particularly as we go into what's looking like a tough election for the Conservatives, I'm going to hope that people say, because I do get people who stop me on the streets and say, I've never voted Tory and I, I really don't want to like the Conservatives, but I do think you're good for our communities. And so you have to hold on to that hope that those people will say, do you know what? I am going to vote for her because she's right for us. But on the day when you're sat there and it's presented like a presidential election, and also you might have many legitimate reasons to be angry about the way that we've governed in the past, or you may just always have hated us and whatever else it is, I think it, I think it will be difficult. But... That's where I cling on to the hope that people go, do you know what, she's done by good, good by her. She's tried. She's not always got things right, but she's tried. I have to say that somebody, <coughs> myself, who has never voted Conservative, I guarantee that you're going to get voted in, in Rutland. Yeah. I mean, what are 46% of the vote? So I have a 27,000 <coughs> majority, me. but on the current polling, that falls to just 3,000. Yeah. And I've also got 50% of a new constituency. So we changed from being Rutland and Melton in the Harbour Villages to Rutland, Stamford, the Stamford Villages and the Harbour Villages. So I would represent three counties, which is against the rules. So I'd be the only MP in the country to represent three counties. But essentially I've got, what, so um, 37,000 people to convince who don't know me. Um, try and vote for me. So it's I think with Stanford, you're pushing an open door, though. No, but I'm not sure we are. So the really thing about Stanford is it's getting more and more liberal. Obviously, we've got a liberal council yeah. now in Rutland. We've got a liberal council in Stanford. We've got a Extinction Rebellion. have got an office in Stanford. There's all sorts of stuff you wouldn't expect. Um, but again, all I've got to do is hope that people go, do you know what? Yeah. Well, that needs, leads us very deeply. You'd think we'd plan this, wouldn't you? Yeah. Into asking you about a day in the life mm -hmm. of a constituency MP. Yeah, and and what in in your four years that you've had so mm. far, uh, is there anything in particular that you you feel that you've done locally that you're mm. you know quite proud yeah, of? Well. So I think it is interesting because people only ever see the kind of London you know pulling mm. you know punches or well, rhetorical punches and stuff, which is not not really my way of doing politics. But the local stuff is the stuff that I love, and whenever they say we can go home on a Wednesday night, I'm the first on the train home. Um, so, I mean, yeah, so today, for example, uh, first thing this morning, we met with a, um, a group, a support group for people who have not a rare, but a reasonably rare health condition. Um, and there was nine people who suffered from it. And essentially they were talking me through about the challenges in terms of the way the NHS diagnoses it or doesn't, the fact that some doctors don't think it's a real condition. Um, and just talking me through what they've been through and therefore how can I support them. Then we went to see a pub that had been flooded and we met with about 10 members of the local community um, who talked to us about what their experience of flooding was so that I can take that away. I, I want to do a lot of work on flooding because we have a serious problem. Um, I've just secured with my councillors an urgent meeting for Rutland County Council. It's the first one in history to be called. 
But if we hadn't called that meeting, there would be no public discussion on flooding until March, which is not yeah. acceptable given we've had two major floods in the last four months. Um, then I'll come to see you. Although we did stop at Hamilton Bakery on the way to oh. get a pippin and a sausage roll so that we had some lunch uh, on the drive in the car. Uh, then this afternoon, I've got an hour and a half. <coughs> sorry, holding David Cameron to account means I'm losing my voice. <laughs> uh, I've got an hour and a half of surgeries this afternoon. So that's people coming in saying, um, I'm trying to think about the kind of ones I've got, and then you've got to depersonalize them. Um, but essentially, people who've had a, a major problem, so either there might be a problem with their visa, or there might be a problem with their child's special educational needs that they're not getting, um, or there may be a problem with their housing association that it's mouldy and the landlord isn't listening. Um, we always get walk ins. So I had a lady walk into my office maybe three weeks ago with a one year old baby in a pram, and she said, My boiler went three days ago. My landlord will not answer my phone calls or my emails. I've got a four month old baby who's freezing. What can you do? So we brought her in out the cold. Um, we gave her all the heaters in my office, which thankfully we had some. And then by, this was on a Friday, by Tuesday we had a new boiler installed into a house. Um, and these are things that people don't hear about that MPs spend their time doing. Um, and then tonight I have a meeting on solar. Um, so a big meeting with some local communities about solar. Um, so that's probably quite representative of a constituency day, flying around the 400 and something square miles that I represent. Um, but, you, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. <coughs> when you said solar, do you mean mm. the stopping the solar panels coming to Langham? Uh, so that there is there is an issue with that. So yes, there is proposals to build a solar plant in Langham, in Barnsdale, in Mus or oh, not in Muston, oh, that's um, in Manton, and then obviously the giant Mallow Pass one. So 50% of all solar proposals for the whole country are in Rutland or Lincolnshire. Well, that, that's a good thing, isn't it? No. Why is that a bad thing? Because we also have the best agricultural land in the country. So the real challenge we have is that we need so. So what I ask the government to do, which they haven't done, which really frustrates me, is to create a national solar strategy and a national land use strategy. So look at the whole country and go, right, the best place for wind in this country are these places. The best place for solar is these places. First of all, put solar on buildings. There's really no reason for it to be on agricultural land, but anyway. But if they had a land use strategy, we would make sure we wouldn't have this problem where councils at the moment can't necessarily say no to things because it's really good quality agricultural land. They'd rather be doing agricultural work because they haven't got the powers to do so. So there's all sorts of challenges. See, that, that makes huge, what you just said makes huge sense. But when you see that reported in the media... It looks like I'm a NIMBY. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And this is the problem with Mallard Pass, so the, the giant 2,100-acre solar plant they want to build not too far from here around Ryle and Essendine. Um, I didn't come out against that for about three or four months because we need solar and we need to go green and we need to get to net zero. But as I looked into the company responsible, first of all, they are the most complicit in genocide in the entire world. They are the most complicit company. So they're called Canadian Solar, which sounds lovely. They're not. They've got, they're called GCL Poly and all sorts of other things. They're a Chinese company. They have been sanctioned by the US. They've been done for trade and uh, tariff dodging by the US. Um, they are in loads of reports that the British government's commissioned that shows they're using Uyghur slave labour and what they're doing. The British company they've partnered with have never built a single um, programme ever, not a single, single infrastructure project. Their last 12 companies went bankrupt, each owing over £100,000 to shareholders every single time. And these are the people that want to build on our land, 10-foot high solar plant, and the way they have behaved. I mean, they rang my office and said to my wonderful <coughs> member of staff, Harry, what does Alicia want to drop her opposition? We'll give her anything she wants. Wow. That is it's essentially trying to bribe a public official and they've hired a lawyer at a cost of £4,000 a day just to manage me because they think I'm such a nightmare. Well, that sounds like construction. Um, I mean, well, <laughs> yes, it probably is. I about to say I should have rung you for some advice. But um, So we will end up with a solar plant in that part of you know Rutland, but not 2,100 acres, not on some of our best agricultural land and definitely not by this company, I hope. Um, but it's just about the strategy. Yeah, you know, We do need solar. It makes huge sense to put it in the most sunniest areas. The, the, sorry, Rutland the, the, ain't the, very sunny. That is a... <laughs> <laughs> that the idea of a strategy is one of the the things that I wanted to very briefly mm. touch on. Because everything is so polarised, you know, say, uh, you don't want the solar, you're an NIMBY. L let's mm -hmm. not look at the nuance behind it. Let's not listen to the, the 30 seconds that you've just explained it. It's, she's a Tory, she's an NIMBY, end of story, or... That should be the Liberal Democrats, but anyway, but yes, yeah. absolutely, they are saying that, um, yes. Uh, so... <laughs> sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Um, black and white. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's black and white. But in terms of strategy, 
one of the things I think that stops us ever having a strategy for something like the NHS or defence or um, the um, net zero is the four to five year election cycle. Mm. Because the, the strategy you just spoke of five minutes ago about the uh, solar and, and wind and, and uh, clean energy anyway, that's 10, 15, 20 mm. years to realise it. And nobody has the patience to to look that far ahead how have we got to this place where you where you you're either in that camp or you're in the other camp and there just is no nuance there's no middle ground so i think the electoral cycle definitely has a role to play and we look back in you know 2010 2011 why all the nuclear decisions weren't made it's because the lib dem said they weren't going to back it that obviously now all of us go that was a wrong decision obviously we've just made some big nuclear decisions in the last few weeks but I think it's a wider problem. So you can talk about social media and the media. There's a big role to play for that. You can talk about politicians themselves who have a lot to apologise for in the way that we do our debates. But the biggest thing for me is that I think when we were growing up, the media was very trusted and it was very black and white in terms of the facts because we only had the facts available to them. With the rise of social media and also the internet, you can find anyone online who will justify the view that you want to hold or that you think you have. And there is no black and white because everything is grey and everything happens to the grey and everything's complex. I think psychologically we as human beings desperately seek the absolute because it's safe and it's definite and you can just adopt that worldview and say, well, that's my worldview and I'm safe in it and I don't, you know, you don't get... Sometimes you see this with wokeism in terms of the kind of, well, that's woke and, you know, or, you know that's anti-woke and therefore you're safe if you put yourself in this box and say, well, I know what I am because you don't have to engage in the nuance and the difficulties and realities. And so I think psychologically we are pushing people to those extremes because mm. they go, well, this is my politics and I'm safe. And they can find an online community that justifies their views and that's that. So I think it's a whole shift about so it's the democratisation of information and access to it and that psychological need we have. But there are so many more problems about it. And if we chose to do better, we could do better. But again, that then comes back to the psychology of having you knowing what your position is and it being opposed to someone else's, again, gives that kind of psychological safety. And then, of course, the media crises with phone hacking and everything else and loss of trust institutions and politicians. And I wish we could go back to the kind of you know, political interviews where you were allowed to have three minutes to answer a question, which you're being very kind in doing. So I will try and give shorter answers. Yeah. But, no, you know, one of my big bugbears in life <coughs> is that we, we're moving to a time where people haven't got time to express themselves. Absolutely. You, everyone's got an interesting story to, to tell and you have to be able to be prepared to listen to them. Mm. That, that's, um, I'm a big fan of Rate and Five Live, mm -hmm. but they, they're moving to that area where they're cutting people short all the time and they're not... I'm sorry, we've got to stop yeah. now. Yeah. Really? And, uh, depending on your point of view, sometimes they're quite selective about who they cut short. I, I yeah. occasionally watch Question Times again. I don't watch it because it's not good for my health. <laughs> but I, I don't watch it either. So my, yeah. my perception as a um, conservative is that the the right the, the right wing politicians on there are, and representatives are nearly always outnumbered, and my perception is that they they're, they're picked on and that they do get cut off, and other people are allowed to go on. That then that's a perception because I have a particular point of view. I suspect that other people see the exact opposite. Um, you, you said about having a few minutes to answer a question. I, he's going to hate me for this, but I've watched GB News. And one of the things I like about GB News, I mean, I can't stand certain aspects of GB News and certain people on GB News, but one of the things I do like is that they, if they do have somebody on there, they do let them speak. And it doesn't matter whether they're right wing, left wing, in the middle. They do actually let them answer the question. Mm. They're not just barking at them yeah. and, or, or te making a statement and saying, do you agree? Yeah. You know, that, so... For that reason only, I it think is a more discursive format. Whereas you watch the BBC or something on Sky, and they will try and do three news stories in ten minutes. <coughs> Sorry, David Cameron really has <coughs> destroyed my voice this week. But they do try and do three stories in ten minutes. Whereas, yeah, GP News, Love on Hate, and will do eight to ten minutes on one story and then move to the next. And I think I, I LBC asked me to host a three-hour radio show um, about six months ago, and I loved it. Because I said to them, what's the format? And they said, you pick three topics and you do one for an hour each. And I went, I get to do a whole hour on a topic, having a proper discussion. I went, yes. I went, 
this is glorious. And obviously I picked some quite controversial topics, um, but it was brilliant. But actually it flew by. By the time you've got people phoning in and you're having a proper debate with them, but, you know, we do things like assisted dying, you know, really complex, difficult topics where you can't do a 10 minute you know, news discussion. And it was wonderful because people called in and you saw people really engaging and discussing. But yeah, it doesn't happen enough. Okay, I'm conscious that we're running out of time. Sorry, that's my fault. No, no, it's not not at all. Um, got a couple of very quick... First of all, we did want to say congratulations on being the first female chair of the Foreign Affairs oh, Select you. Committee. About time. And it's an extraordinary <laughs> achievement. Like 800 years. To, <laughs> but that's one of the, the, the more senior committees. And your first term in Parliament to mm. be given that role, there's, that's a big, big achievement. Thank you. So, yeah, it was quite controversial at the time. Um, and I wasn't sh I wasn't going to run actually. It an SNP MP came to me and said you need to stand um, because he I was on the committee already and all the people standing weren't. But it was controversial because I've been an MP for three years, whereas my three opponents had all been MPs for over thirty years. And it was Ian Duncan Smith, obviously former leader of my party, Sir Liam Fox, obviously former Defence Secretary, and then Richard Graham. So it was. It was controversial, but um, yeah, it means the world to me. No, but that's a, that's a massive achievement. Um, what do you think the election will be won and lost on? So I think ultimately it is always won or lost on two things, which is A, the economy. I think the economy is absolutely fundamental, whether people want to admit it or not, but not in the economy in the way that sometimes politicians talk about it, you know, what is inflation at and things like that. It's, it's how people feel. So how people feel about whether they're struggling or not and what they, whether they can get through the week and through the month. But I also think it's that gut feeling. And I have a real issue with the fact that politics is done so much on polling because polling quite often, A, the questions aren't asked very well. B, it's not qualitative where you can analyse people's language and understand how they really feel about it. But it's what they think and not what they feel. And I think actually when people go to vote, I think Brexit's a really good example I'm not sure, and I'm, you know, I, I did vote for Brexit, but I think a lot of people voted for Brexit. It was a heart issue. It was how you felt in your heart, not necessarily how you were thinking or the logical. And I'm not saying it was illogical, but that difference in politics where we always target the head and what people think, mm -hmm. I think we spend far more time... When people vote for you, I think people need to be able to feel that they can put your trust in you, yes, but that they do feel like you're pulling in the right direction and that you are fighting for them. Whereas we focus on, you know, do they think the economy is going well? Yes. Do they think the economy is getting better? Yes or no? They might say yes. Doesn't mean they're going to vote for you. So, yeah, for me, it's the economy, but it's also that gut instinct of how feelings. people feel about you. People yeah. will make a lot of important decisions based on feelings. Yeah. yeah well, on Brexit, my heart said leave. I, I just don't like, in principle, the idea of this mm. supranational organisation. Um, but my head said remain. And I was waiting to be given a reason to vote Remain. And but it, see, I'm the exact same. And it never came. It was the exact same heart overhead. I uh, went with my heart. I, I said... Uh, How did I, you I vote? To leave. Did you? Uh, yeah, he was Remain, obviously. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm what you might call soft leave. Yeah. He's um, continu Hardcore remain. continuity Remain. <laughs> yeah. um, or rejoin now. But uh, but the, the thing that, I, that the Remain campaign didn't do, which mm. I thought they should have done... Do you remember the Monty Python sketch, what did the Romans ever do for us? Oh, yeah. If they had said, well, what have you ever done for us, mm. and actually given you a list of a dozen mm. positive things, that probably would have been enough to tip me the other way. Mm. I, was, I was looking for a reason, yeah. but, but come you there, none. And that negotiation finished me off. That was oh, pathetic. Yeah. So. It's quite interesting, though, because I think now as an MP, I would choose to leave again only because... I have seen, particularly when it comes to foreign policy, the freedoms that being outside the EU has given us. And I see, and also I see, I'm so unimpressed with the EU Parliament. I mean, I engage with them all the time. I am a European. I am a European, but I have left the EU. And I feel very strong about that, having a grown up in Germany briefly, but all my friends are. I do so much work bringing together European chairs of foreign affairs committees together, and we all work together really well. But when it comes to the work I'm trying to achieve, being outside the EU is making it easier for us to move forward on foreign policy and do things better than we would have been able to do within the system. What, about, so from a defense, what about from a defence perspective? 100%, because the EU has nothing to do with our defence. Absolutely nothing. And that, that was one of my greatest frustrations, because I, I worked at the MOD before mm -hmm. I went to the Foreign Office. 
hearing people talk about an EU army, which was a nonsense, although it starts creeping up again, um, but hearing people say about, you know, well, this is fundamental to our defence. It's not, because NATO is the cornerstone of our defence, along with Five Eyes. The EU is a political amalgamation where there's little to no agreement on defence. That's only getting worse, particularly as we see governments like Slovakia and Hungary, and obviously we've had Poland, but obviously they're now back in a better place. We on a foreign policy perspective and national security perspective, are in a better place being outside the EU. And given that's my expertise, I see the benefits of those freedoms when I try and do what I do as chair. But I recognise there are other areas where we still need to do a lot more. And farming... Food. Yeah, food and farming is one of those, although in the last two months we've made big progress on that. So labelling, we've just rolled out big extension. We rolled out a massive extension to farmer support in the last two months, which takes them beyond what they ever got with the EU. So we're getting there, but we've also had to contend with massive inflationary pressures and everything else like that that would have made it so difficult to get where we wanted to get to. Pharmaceuticals? Pharmaceuticals, yep, there's more to be done. But again, we are seeing pharmaceutical companies now deciding they want to create their headquarters in the UK, which is fabulous, and that's exactly what we want. First of all, I'm really interested in you being uh, a lady mm -hmm. in Parliament because we constantly see a lot of uh, on the media about women being abused. Mm. And... All the countries that I like in Europe seem to have a huge amount of female MPs. Mm -hmm. So how can we get to the point where we have more women in Parliament and, and what can we do to stop women being abused in Parliament? So I actually think on the point about abusing women less in Parliament, I think it actually is a societal issue. I think mm -hmm. women just get the brunt of it because as a society, we still, I mean, I still see far too much domestic abuse through my door uh, as an MP. Um, you know, spiking, sexual assaults, you know, upskirting, all these different things. They're all symptomatic of the fact that we haven't yet got to a place where we don't have a lot of problems in terms of sex in our society. There is, every MP gets abuse. I mean, yes, I had a lovely email from someone saying, um, what was it, I hope you get the gun, I hope you get... Uh, something essentially saying, I hope you get shot. And then, but he was using it in a way where he tried to make it sound clever, like he was just trying to get me sacked, but then said, ho ho, I hope I was still allowed to say that. It's like, well, that's not funny. And on a daily basis, you'll get an email saying you don't deserve to breathe or you're corrupt or you're evil or you're a fascist. And actually that underlying level of contempt for politicians is actually sometimes harder than the actual threats. So I probably get about a death threat a month. Um, which, well, sorry, yeah, it just sounds a bit ridiculous when I say it, that blase. Um, it's gone up, there we go. So, um, and obviously I get threats from abroad, which a lot of MPs don't get. So, you know, the Serbian president has threatened me, the Chinese have got me on a trouble list, the Russians have put me on multiple different lists. And when they attack me publicly, I get attacked by their populations. Um, but the death threats, women, obviously, we get rape threats. We get threats against our own children, which I don't think many male MPs get. Um, and I have spoken about the fact that I have a panic alarm in every bedroom and every room in our house because the police said I needed it. Some of my friends wear stab vests in their own constituencies because that's when you're most at risk. Um, not because constituents are mad, but because that one lunatic who's hunting you down, I never put on public, even in Rutherford Mountain in my home, I never put on social media where I'm going to be in advance. Um, and on Christmas Eve, my friend's office was firebombed. And thank God his staff weren't in there. And obviously David was murdered, Joe was murdered. Mm. Um, it is. It ma it makes you question quite regularly why you do what you do, not least because it's also just an awful job. I mean, it is an awful job. You're away from home from your kids three or four nights a week. Everyone assumes you are either corrupt or on the take or some sort of bad person in some way. Every decision you make is on TV. Every decision, policy position you take, the whole world knows. Every speech you give is on TV. Every email you write could get leaked to the media. But despite all of that, there is no other job where you can change someone's lives every single day. Whether it's a woman ringing me saying, I'm being domestically abused, can you get me out tonight and we make it happen? Whether it's a homeless person and you get them into shelter. Or whether it's standing up and saying, I think there's going to be a terror attack in Kosovo and we've got to do something. And then seeing as a result of everything you've been shouting about, us double the number of troops on the ground. No other job gives you that privilege. But the costs, the costs are a lot. I mean, I think 50% of all Conservative MPs elected in 2010 were divorced by 2017. Wow. And that is a pretty massive number. Wow. Um, yeah. We were talking about correlation and causation on the way over here. Yeah. We? Where were you? Yeah. yeah. So how do we get, how do we attract more women? Because having yeah. said all that, how on earth are we going to get 50% um, female parliament? 
I mean, other countries do it, so we have to be able to do it. But other countries, MPs only sit like once a month or twice a month, whereas we sit three or four days a week. Um, so that's a far bigger challenge. Um, but I also wouldn't necessarily want to change that because we need to be there. You know, we need to be in Parliament holding the government to account. We do need to improve the level of discourse. We do need to make sure that we don't treat... So the reason why most MPs don't have security measures, didn't have security measures until uh, 2020, was because if you asked for a security measure, it got published as an expense. So when there's all those big stories about MPs' expenses, you know, £150,000... Yeah, that's because my salary um, budget for my team is £170,000 for me to hire my staff. And I have all my staff and it comes up to £150,000 a year. You then added on to it, well, they, they asked for, you know, um, you can put these things in windows that mean that when a bomb gets thrown or something gets thrown, it doesn't quite shatter in the same way to protect you better. It's not quite bomb proof, but it's better. Um, you know, they were putting those as expenses and MPs were saying, well, I'm just getting bashed now for being, you know, 30 grand more expensive because I asked for this in my window. Um, we have to stop assuming that MPs are bad people trying to take opportunity, but then we also need MPs to stop misbehaving. And it makes me so angry when we see the few disproportionate numbers absolutely make the rest of us look like we are corrupt and on the take and just bad people. So we do need to think about working hours, we need to think about the way we approach things. You know, we start at 2pm on a Monday because some people travel for 11 hours to get to Parliament each way. Um, but we don't start voting till 10 p.m. on a Monday night. So you're never home before midnight because each vote takes around 25 minutes and you have multiple votes. I don't know what the solution is. And by home, you mean your London London constituency. Oh, gosh. Home, home. Can you imagine trying to get back to Rutland? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but essentially, we need to demand better of ourselves as MPs. The public need to recognise that they need to change the, the tone and the discussion they have with their MPs because I think when they do polling of... Um, <laughs> British people, 80-something percent say their local MP is fab, it's just the rest of them. Well, that can't be the case. Um, and then beyond that, I just, I don't really know, but I spend a lot of time trying to tutor, not tutor, um, champion and support other women into Parliament. I also think having more women in Parliament would make a big difference. It would change the tone, it would change the focus. Women tend to come in because they want to change policies, whereas a lot of the men, unfortunately, I hate saying this, but it, it is true come in because they love the drama and they love the hating the Labour Party and the hating the Lib Dems and hating this. I'm not interested in that. I don't hate the Labour Party. I don't hate the SNP. I don't hate any of them. I fundamentally disagree with them and the way they want to do things, but I don't hate them. And too many men do love the kind of theatre of the chamber and being a glad... You know, Boris, we used to say about him, you needed to really make a noise in the chamber because he needed sand being thrown in his eyes for him to be able to perform. You know, that, that's not what we need. We need people who are there to talk about the national interest and get things done. I know we're running for time. I've got one very quick, hopefully, on, one, one line, one word answer. If you could fix one thing, what would it be? I don't know how you would do this, and that's probably why it'd be the one I'd fix, but I would end child abuse overnight. And I don't know how you would do that. But if we could end child abuse, and therefore the care system and everything else around it, you know, our prisons would be half as busy, you know, we wouldn't have as many people homeless. And... I think so much of the way that adults engage with one another and the options available to them in their lives come back to whether or not they were able to have a childhood where they were loved and secure and safe. Um, and there is nothing I find more difficult than when we have to work on child abuse cases. Um, so, yeah, I would end that. And that's such a awfully sad way to end the podcast, but it's the one thing where I don't know what you do overnight. So let's let's end it on a happier note. Go on, then. yeah. <coughs> where's, where's Alicia going to be in... 15, 20 years' time. I mean, hopefully still the MP for Rutland and Stanford, but that's in your hands. I look to you. Um, if not? Uh, if not. Um, I don't know what you do when you stop becoming an MP. Um, I'd, I would go back into counter-terrorism, um, counter-hostile states, um, because you can serve your country and do something and make a difference. And there's going to be a lot more of that needed, unfortunately. That's brilliant. Um, it's been you, fantastic. Thank yeah. you yeah. so Thank much. You. Or I might go open a giant foster home and just have... There you go. Take hundreds of kids out of the care home system and have them all live in a big house with me. That's the other option. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. um, thank you very much for your time. Thank that you. That was um, one of the most interesting hours of, of my life so far. Oh, so I yeah. hope I didn't ramble too much. No, that was absolutely fascinating, actually. Thank you. Do me a favour. Can you listen for a minute? Of course. What's wrong? I don't even know how to say this. When you have a concern about child sexual abuse, 
The fear of getting it wrong can stop us from doing what's right. Child sexual abuse is underreported in the UK, but we can all do something to keep children safe. If you've got a concern, trust your instincts. Search NSPCC Helpline or call 0808 800 5000. Thank you for listening to our chat with Alicia. Next episode comes from the Whipper Inn, soon to be the George Inn, at the Marketplace in Oakham, Rutland. We chat with Rick Turner, the new owner, and discuss his big plans for his hotel, restaurant and pub. Our special guest is the chairman of Rutland County Council, Andrew Brown, JP. So, that's a wrap. And thank you for listening to our latest Pub Natter. If you visit timothyives.com forward slash pub natter, you will find photos, links and more information about each episode. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and please subscribe to ensure you don't miss a pub or one of our amazing guests. The Pub Natter theme tune is by Tom Arnold. That was a Pub Natter broadcast. Thank you.